Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, today's EU Green Week partner event is all about young people who are active in rural areas who are doing their bit to ensure that we have a just transition that we work towards um, a future that is sustainable um, that can fight against biodiversity loss, that is combating climate change, and that is building a sustainable agriculture and food system um, for us here in Europe. So that is on the agenda. Um, we have three sessions today. The first will be a sharing of stories. We have three young people who will be sharing their stories with us today. And then we will have an experience sharing session with our um, guest speaker from the European Commission. And lastly, we will have a session just sharing opportunities for all of you, hearing new things, um, hearing how you can get involved, how you can get inspired, and also um, hearing from you. So that's what we have to look forward to today. My name is Jessica Miklum Kolnich. I'm from the Europark Federation, where I'm the youth officer there. And I'm really excited about this session, and I hope that it will bring lots of joy, lots of inspiration, and that you all leave with a smile on your face. So um, I would also like to say you're very welcome to use the chat. Um, we will be having a a couple of other tools later we, which you can also use to share your thoughts. And um, first, I would like to start with a poll. We're going to be using Mentimeter. Um, there will be a link in the chat very soon. And because we're talking all about rural areas, uh, we'd like to ask you the very first question, which is what, uh, how would you describe a rural area in your country? This can vary between different countries in Europe, and we would like to know, what is your definition? I will be sharing my screen so that you can see. Um, the answers, I see that they are starting to come in. One second. There we go. So how would you describe rural areas in your country? We see here beautiful. Yes, I have seen very many examples of beautiful rural areas in Europe. Cut off, also a really good point. Um, it's difficult to reach lots of rural areas um, with public transport, if that's the only source of transport that you have. Um, empty, that's a good question. Um, I would like to know empty of what for whoever wrote that. If you want to elaborate in the chat, I'd be interested to know. Isolated can be isolated from, uh, from big cities and from other places. Have scenic, um, we have lovely, we have little internet connectivity, something that we um, that I was sharing about earlier. Full of potential, I really like that. That's very, very hopeful. And that's what we aim to, to do here at Europe Park is bring hope. Remote, um, yeah. So that's one of the, one of the synonyms for, for rural is, is re remote in, in my opinion. Um, has a low population, yes, especially compared to dense cities. Not really existing. That would be a perspective from your country. I think there are very many countries uh, where we have a really high rate of urbanization of land development and that it's very challenging to define rural in those different, um, in different countries and different provinces. Thank you so much for sharing that. Then on to our next question. We'd like to ask you how you would... I'm struggling to get to the next question. One second, please. In the bottom left, the arrow should move it. Doesn't seem to. Ah, there. There we go. Thank you, Sandra. No worries. Um, in which category is the place that you call home? We'd like to know uh, if you come from a rural area, if you come from an urban area, 
or if you would just classify it as in between. And the place you call home is up to your own definition. I don't know if you are a student and you're currently studying in the city, but you refer to home as a different place or where you grew up or where your parents are. So it's up to you to decide. And we'd like to know from our participants, yeah, where are you coming from? So you see most people are from an urban area. Some are from a rural area, and we have some who also are from an in-between area. So I think very, very many young people are currently uh, moving to urban areas or are there to find jobs or, um, yeah, for their studies. Um, but it's lovely to see that there are quite a few of you who call home a place that's in a more rural area. see most of the answers have come in. So with that, I think I will stop sharing. If you haven't answered yet, feel free to answer. Um, and we will use those pictures and post them on social media afterwards as well. So thank you for participating in that and just giving us a little bit of an experience of who our audience is today and what your thoughts are and, and your feelings on the topic of rural areas. With that, I'd like to jump straight into our session of sharing our stories. So as I mentioned, we have three very passionate young people with us today, actually four, <laughs> my apologies, uh, to Rural Youth Europe who have brought two speakers today, which is really lovely. And we will be hearing their stories. So first up, we have Kyle who is involved with Europark. She has been a junior ranger and a youth pluser, and she will be explaining to you exactly what that means and what the young people in Europe do uh, for biodiversity. So over to you, Kyleen. Yeah, okay, now I can speak. Um, well, I'm Kardijn, I'm from the Netherlands, um, and when I was around 15, I got involved with the Junior Ranger Program. The Junior Ranger Program is organized by Europark, and Europark is an, a network organization for uh, national parks um, all throughout Europe, um, who, and also the companies who are involved uh, with uh, the national parks and Europe Park wanted to uh, get more youth or young people involved um, so a few years back I think they're more than a few years back but um, they started out with junior ranger program and started out with a couple of national parks joining up um, and now I don't know the number but even in the Netherlands I think we have around seven national parks and that's quite a bit for such a small country um, and within the junior ranger program it varies within uh, which um, country um, partic you're participating but um, we're going out with the young people um, with the rangers and well uh, it varies with um, the excursions which sort of um, stuff we do uh, for example, we're working in a forest or we would uh, join up with an excursion and learn about like uh, ants or some kind of birds. Um, and then um, Junior Ranger program is around from 13 years old to 18 years old. But when they when people turn 18, um, you sort of lose them because they um, most likely are to move from the rural area where they are joining up uh, the junior ranger program. So we wanted to get them involved um, throughout when they are 18 plus. So they started the Youth Plus program, which I am also involved with. Um, and then it's about um, mostly also national, um, well, national things. Um, you can participate in or helping with the junior ranger program, also international. Um, so speaking uh, for these events, 
um, we're also uh, trying out to um, organize other things, which I will be talking about later. Um, so yeah, I think that was it. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Colleen. And also, you now are a kindergarten teacher and yeah. having been part of the Junior Rangers since you were, how old were you when you started? Uh, I started around when I was 15 and I'm almost 25 years old now. So I'm, I've been in the program for 10 years, I think. Yeah, and you're still super active um, and organizing events and mm -hmm. also bringing that what you've learned about biodiversity, about nature, about ecosystems, into the classroom. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, I try to get the kids out as much as possible, but sometimes it's hard. So uh, we planted some uh, greens as well. So we're trying to get our own tomatoes and um, squash as well. So yeah, I th and also getting my colleagues to get the kids outdoors. So I think that's a very good opportunity to get young people involved in the Junior Ranger program and then get them passionate about nature. Um, and then when they grow up and turn 18 and go to study whatever, they still um, are taking those experiences with them and maybe enthusiast, uh, get people enthusiastic about, um, well, the nature and doing green stuff in their own, um, well, area of work. Thank you very much, Caroline. Yeah, it's really inspiring to hear. With the junior rangers, um, it often depends on the country, um, what sort of activities they do on the park. Um, and with the Youth Plus program, it's very often the young people that take the lead, that decide what they want to do, how mm -hmm. they want to do it, whether they want to organize a camp, um, et cetera. So thank you so much for joining us, Caroline, and, and sharing your story. Next up, we will have Emma from Youth and Environment Europe. Uh, she is going to be sharing a little bit about her journey uh, volunteering with this organization and what they are doing uh, for young people in rural areas. Yeah, so thank you so much for um, passing that over to me. Um, I, that was really interesting hearing from yourself before. Um, and I'm so glad to have the opportunity to speak to everyone today. Um, so I guess I'm going to come at this from a really funky angle. So I'm going to talk about my role right now, um, but kind of how I got there, because I think the journey there is quite interesting. And I'm sure that'll link on to some of the stuff that we're, that's going on um, later on. But yeah, so um, as I already mentioned, um, I'm Emma. Um, I'm from Scotland, um, which is a really unique position in itself, obviously, given the current political climate around that, but we'll not get into that. Um, so I am a project communications officer at Youth Environment Europe, um, which is the largest independent European network of environmental youth organisations. I work specifically on a project called EU Teens for Green, which is managed by a consortium, as we call it, um, which is composed of Startup Europe Regions Network, or commonly referred to as CERN, um, ourselves, so Youth Environment Europe, um, which we most of the time called YEE, um, and CEE Bankwatch Network. And we also have the support of the association um, Generation Climate Europe, or sometimes referred to as GCE. So the project itself, EU Teens for Green, um, supports projects, smaller projects, um, which we empower young people um, in just transition regions to create sustainable projects for their local communities. And that obviously um, applies to rural areas too. Um, and we've seen actually a lot of um, work in rural areas and um, people kind of focusing on this idea of creating a kind of legacy for more young people to make sure they, they want to stay in where they're from, which is really interesting to hear from. I myself aren't from a rural area, but being able to hear that perspective um, from people I find really, really valuable. And it's something that we obviously advocate for too. Um, so we essentially the project thinks that it's important to raise awareness 
um, about the realities that residents of just transition regions in, in the European Union face. Um, and the project was launched by the European Union as an opportunity for teens and young adults to take ownership and become actors of change um, when proposing actions to help build a green recovery in their region. Hence, um, contribute to the good governance of the co cohesion policy. And that's one I always like get a wee bit muddled on. But that's kind of generally about our role. But um, I'll talk a wee bit more about how I became part of that. Um, so I started my role um, at YE um, at the beginning of April this year, um, which seems like it's pretty new, but I actually, like, looking at it, it's been one of the coolest jobs that I've had. Like, the team is really great, everybody's so welcoming, and it's so um, just fab to be part of a, a group where people have like like-minded ideas and everybody has this passion just generally for the climate and then obviously specifically with my project Just Transition. Um, I guess kind of a, a background with that is um, in my country specifically Scotland um, I've been involved in youth politics since I was about 12 and um, on a bunch of different things um, mainly the Scottish Youth Parliament, which probably will become into um, a question later on, but we'll get there. Um, so yeah, my, my journey has been really interesting. And I mean, I think it's quite cool to be 19 and be part of an organisation that's youth led um, and an organisation that's doing such important work with key decision makers and stakeholders. Um, and hopefully, I kind of just, obviously it's been a quite brief, but that's maybe inspired some people that are listening and that are part of um, this kind of workshop conference style thing today to um, kind of get rid of the imposter syndrome and really feel that like young people can be in these spaces. And that was something that was told to me and it's totally true. Like everybody that's speaking today is living proof of that. Um, you're capable of being in these roles. Um, you just got to kind of take that leap of faith. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to everyone today. Thank you much for sharing, Emma. Um, I just have one follow-up question for you. Can you name us one example of these projects that young young teenagers are doing um, in the te EU Teens for Green? Yeah, so we've got 79 projects. Um, and I specifically do a lot of work around our podcast. Um, and we've actually just started some of the projects on it so if you want to find out more I would direct you there and um, to listen from the people themselves and um, I've just spoken to somebody actually this podcast episode isn't out yet um, but um, their project is based in it's a region in Spain but I can't remember the name of the region and um, but it's rural and they've created a kind of community that is um, like all themed around like gin and moving um, the person that I interviewed talked specifically about like energy. So they, it's, what's the word that I'm trying to look for? It's basically this small community of young people um, and they live off of like solar paddles or planting their own food and crops. Um, and I'll get the name of the project, but there's so many of them that honestly, they slip my mind so fast. There's all, and um, I think it's Finland. It's a Scandinavian country kind of, or, um, the up that kind of area um and their project they do um it's kind of like they've been doing webinars um that are specifically to give young people and empower young people with the knowledge they would need to make sustainable choices and they're acting now um translating those into like languages that are used in like rural areas and more like specific communities in their country to kind of bridge that gap because often we do see particularly in Scotland and our rural areas so the highlands and the islands we talk specifically about rural deprivation so rural young people don't have access to the same things as people from big cities um, and it's about bridging that gap and that information and knowledge um, but as I said there's 79 projects which is a lot um, and I would very much encourage you to go listen to the podcast and hear from the people themselves because they can speak on their projects probably significantly better than I can um, but yeah, it's just been really inspiring. And I, every time I talk about it, I'm smiling. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answered your question. Thank you so much. Yes, it will. I'm sure later um, the link to the podcast will be posted in the chat and, uh, and everyone can take a listen to that. So 79 projects. Whoa, that is quite a lot. Um, and I know that these were also very young people as well. Um, I think teenagers up to the age of 25. 
who were given micro grants to be able to to do these projects and that's really amazing um in rural areas where we really need um you know a just transition and and um yeah access to to opportunities so thank you very much for that emma next up we have niall and tomas from rural youth europe and they're going to be sharing us a little bit about their organization and their project on agriculture. So over to you, Niall. I think you're gonna give a, pres um, a talk first about the organization and then Tomas is gonna follow up with the agricultural project. Thank you. Yep, thank you very much, Jessica. Um, thanks very much for having us here today and uh, being a partner in, in the webinar. <laughs> So, hi, yeah, I'm Niall Evans, uh, Chairman of Rural Youth Europe. Um, we are a multinational organisa umbrella organisation that encompasses um, 20 different organisations, uh, youth, rural youth organisations from across them, 17 different countries. Um, we are mainly uh, made up of um, young farmers and 4-H four, four clubs. Uh, we've been going since 1957, so last year we celebrated our 65th year. Um, so our main job is to sort of empower young people, provide them with tools to go out and um, promote uh, rural life um, and, and get the most out of rural, rural life. Um, the last couple of years we've been focusing very much on the sustainability um within um not just agriculture but it, within within general um we normally have we'll speak a bit more about about our events late, later on but our main our biggest thing is uh we held three events each year we have a study session which um is a much more focused event uh, usually on a specific topic um then we have our european rally which brings together um, members from across Europe, um, normally between 60 and 80 members, um, come together for a week to discuss a specific topic hosted by one of our member organisations. Um, and then we have an autumn seminar, which is a much smaller version of, of the rally, per se. Um, so, yeah, our, we, our purpose was to um, yeah, bring together young, young people and... Um, allow them to have the you yeah, have the opportunities um around around uh around the continent um and provide the skills uh we do we've done quite a bit with policy work over the last last few years um and then this year um again it's it's, it's finalizing our our role on sustainability and we've done quite a bit on mental health um ar around that as well especially in the in the rural areas um finding that being quite a big big topic these days um so my my journey i suppose from through through that i joined um, i joined the board five years ago or four years ago this year i've been a member of young farmers now in wales um for the past 12 years so i've known these sort of these sort of organizations now for quite a while um and i suppose my my job is to sort of promote to that and advocate for 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 young people across across um yeah across the organization um i live in quite a rural area living in the middle of wales there's not a lot around here um so yeah we're quite uh, quite isolated I, su I suppose um but yeah um i i we're we're here just to just to give give those opportunities to people and to help promote um what, what rural rural areas um could give to to younger people um we see quite a lot of of people now moving from the rural areas into into the urban areas but uh, I think our purpose here is to just try and show what what rural areas have to uh, have to offer and um, try and get what what we can for for rural young people. So um, that's probably enough enough waffling from from myself. Um, I will pass you on to Thomas now, who will speak a bit more about um, what are the projects that we're working on. Thank you. 
Thank you, Niall. Um, good afternoon, all. Uh, thank you for the invite. Um, it's uh, very nice to hear all this uh, testifying, and it really inspires us as young people um, to really um, be more conscious about the, um, the importance of the rural areas. Um, so, uh, Jessica invited me here today to talk a little bit about my journey on the rural youth Europe. Uh, it uh, all started in January this, this year. Um, I'm 24 years old. I'm a young uh, uh, from rural area uh, from Portugal, um, and I am project manager for the Cucuriado, um, a European project uh, with the overall objective um, of coordinating support actions that we balance the position of the, the farmers in supply chain and procurement systems. Um, so the, in Cucuyado, our organization mainly uh, works on the, the aspect of this uh, project having an ambassador network. So Cucuyado invested in trainings and educational materials, uh, decision support tools, complemented with the co-creation of the seed initiative uh, in, in Petris, in Petris um, within the ambassador network composed by uh, 40 ambassadors from rural areas, all young people, uh, in order to enhance uh, the, the position of the farmers and also to empower the voice of the of young people from rural areas. Um, it's really funny, uh, Carlin was talking about Link, uh, the teaching the children uh, with the sustainability and uh, nature uh, matters. And one of our seed initiatives from one ambassador in the, the Cucuriado is having like a school farm. He's also a teacher from Slovenia. Uh, and it's really funny to see how we, all things are linked and um, how really people really um, want to start with education from young people. Um, through young people of our age, <laughs> not children, and then to to adults, uh, and that's the the really importance also for this um, webinar. Um, give our perspective, so I can also add you the know how and the skills that I acquired from this uh, rural UC Europe experience. So basically, uh, it helped me to develop knowledge about decision makers at EU level. That is very important when you want to communicate our ideas and uh, our, our statements. Um, it really helps also to meet new people from different realities, give us a perspective or a broader perspective of what is really happening in different rural areas because all countries are different. Uh, besides, we are all, uh, all in Europe. Uh, also about knowledge about organization of events such this one oriented to create answers to cross-cutting problems that we all feel that we all have something to add, um, and also to this will, um, of course, um, give this understanding that young people voice really counts a lot, and it's more powerful than people sometimes think. And that the work also that we want to do as an organization uh, empower young people um, to to be uh, active uh, in the community to really give the, them inputs. We are valuable. Um, and really want to make path for them uh, to, to develop um, some good practices and to give them inputs, so valuable inputs. Uh, also, develop critical thinking uh, and some perspective of activism through bigger causes. Uh, nowadays, we see a lot of um, activism on bigger causes and we identify a lot and we have all these movements and it's important to continue to be that way. And for us, it's important to empower that and to really give um, the, the idea that people need to, to do this and people need to keep uh, fighting for the, what they feel that is um, right. And um, yeah, basically is that. Um, I'm just one <laughs> vehicle from our organization. Um, but uh, I will maybe say for you to visit the Cucuriado website, also uh, to listen our podcasts uh, from Rural Youth Fuel, uh, the ones um, to the Cucuriado project and the ones to the to organization. 
uh, we will have um, more view and perspective what what is really happening and uh, what's around us. Um, so yeah, basically that's the that is the slide that I want to give. Uh, thank you again, uh, and hope this webinar be the starting point for something uh, that really give us to young transition at the full. Thank you. Thank you very much, Niall and Tomas. It's really lovely to hear uh, what you're doing. And I have seen and have been following you on social media and you're very active. You touch on many topics. You mentioned mental health and you know, you've got the strong focus on agriculture and sustainability, but I know you've also touched on gender topics and it's really amazing the opportunities that you bring, especially for young people in rural areas across Europe. I also know, um, that you're quite involved with um, the Council of Europe as well. Um, and it's really, really amazing to, to see these workshops. So I do recommend um, to all of you to have a look at these uh, youth organizations um, and youth opportunities and find them on social media, follow them, listen to the podcasts um, if you're a podcast person. So it's, it's really inspiring to hear what young people do. And so we'd like to hear from you, our audience, um, the three stories you've, or four stories, sorry, and um, that you've just heard, uh, what did you find the most inspiring about them? We have shared a link to a Padlet in the chat. It's got the three different sections that we'll be covering today. And at the end of each section, there is a question for you. So if you see the first question, we're asking you, you know, what aspects of the stories that you heard were most inspiring for you? And um, you can just add a comment at the below. Yeah, uh, you can type in your comment exactly there and uh, let us know what you think. Thank you so much to my colleague, Sandra, who's doing the tech support for us today. And uh, she can, has just shown you how you can add your comment if you're unfamiliar with Padlet. We'd love to, to see some comments from you. So take a moment, it doesn't have to be long a few um, thoughts and ideas of what you found to be the most inspiring, please do share with us. Yes, the optimism, it is really lovely. Um, thank you to our th four speakers today. Um, it's really, really nice to, to hear from you. And with that, I would like to go on to our next session. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we have a lovely guest from the European Commission. We have with us today Maria Gafo Gomez Zamalao. I hope I pronounced that properly. And she is the deputy head of the unit of one of the units of DG Agri, and she deals with social sustainability and works with young people in rural areas. So, Maria, thank you so much for uh, being with us today and being here to share your experiences. And we just really have some questions about you, um, about your experiences and learning from, from yeah, your life. So I'd like to start and ask you, where did you grow up and what sort of sustainable practices did you participate in when you were a young person? Thanks a lot, Jessica. And just to start, I would like to thank you for, for inviting me to, to participate. And I came to speak about me, but I came also to listen and, and I have listened very carefully to the to the previous speakers. So I will talk a little bit about me, but it looks like the age of the dinosaurs. So when, when I was young, there was no internet, there were no GSMs, there was no recycling. So it's it looks like a, a completely different world. So on recycling, now you have these yellow, blue bags and, and, and all these places, but at that time, these didn't exist. So one, one thing that I did is that I collected the, the paper from home, from, from relatives, etc. And then you had to bring it to some special places where they pay you by weight. So you can give the paper and depending on the kilos, you get some, some weight. And just an anecdote, my grandma had really old magazines and newspapers, 30, 40 years old. So I collected all these magazines and I sold them by weight. And I think now they would worth <laughs> much more because of course they were some some historical and then also and i'm from madrid so a big city but i like very much the nature and the countryside so i was in a in a group where i was going regularly to the countryside and sometimes we were organizing some some cleaning so so yes like like it is done now so to clean the the garbage maybe a couple of times per year in the in the countryside
Thank you so much for that. I'd like to give the floor to Carleen to share uh, her thoughts on that and ask the next question. Yeah. Um, well, it's nice to hear that even in the in the past, they were already trying to, uh, well, sort of collect um, on the zero waste. Um, and nowadays you see a lot of zero waste. Um, we also have in my city uh, where I live, we have the zero waste tours as well. So people can sign up and uh, you can walk around the city and see all the different kind of spots where you can uh, go to with your own um, pots and uh, do your groceries with that with zero waste. So I think that's a good thing as well. And I'm trying to do that as well in my own home. But when I was a student, it was quite difficult because most of the zero waste stuff is quite expensive sometimes, uh, but you find a way and you get creative. Um, just like Maria also was trying to get the magazines. Um, but nowadays you see a lot of opportunities coming up uh, for the young people as well. Um, for example, these programs that we talked about earlier. How was that for you, Maria? Were there any opportunities for you to get involved? So I think uh, at that time, the opportunities were not so numerous as now, I think. So um, in the environmental field, there was really not, not much. So when I studied the university, I started being in an environmental NGO, but there were not so many actions. But then there were some other opportunities in the social field. So I was in, um, in another NGO and, and we were doing some voluntary work in the cities. There were many different types of projects. So I was for example, in an AIDS hospital at, in the 90s, the war dates, it was like, um, I don't know, Ebola now or something like, something like this. So during five or six years, I was going with some, some people on a, on a weekly basis. And then in the summers, I was going to South America to some development projects. So I, this, this experience was really, really nice and important for me. And I, I think it, it, uh, it contributed to make me who I am now. So I was in, in Mexico, Ecuador and, and Paraguay. And the last project in Paraguay, it was with some native communities. Um, it's, a, it's an area, it's called El Chaco, which is really, really dry. And some of the native communities there do not come from there. So they were pushed by governments from outside of their place. And they really didn't know how to cultivate the land or, or anything because they didn't have the, the knowledge. So basically, we, we tried to support them and to give them some, some knowledge on, on agriculture so that they could eat. So just the, the basic, basic thing. But this experience was really, really, really important for, for me. And I think it, it, it had a big impact in my, in my life. Thank you so much for sharing that. That was really, really interesting. I'm sitting here like, wow. Um, I love hearing about other people's experiences. Um, and it's particularly cool to hear about your experience, like um, when you were growing up and when you were a young person um, and going through like all those cool, exciting um, kind of moments of your life. Um, so yeah, I think that's really cool to hear. Um, and like kind of comparing it to the experience I've had which has led me to where I am right now, like in Scotland. So we have, we're very lucky to have an absolutely incredible youth parliament. Um, and we have a working agreement with um, our like, kind of adult parliament, so our Scottish parliament. Um, and I've been lucky enough to be an elected member as part of that. Um, so it's really cool to hear like the kind of evolution, I guess, and how we've gone from the kind of, as you say, Maria, like, um, maybe not having so many opportunities to there being like I'm pretty sure there's like Welsh par youth parliaments and we have a UK youth parliament and there's obviously um so many European opportunities as well and uh, there's like tons I would name them all but I can't um and particularly like EU teams for green there's just all these opportunities going about and and obviously the ones we've heard heard from already and um, so it's really positive to see how much um, youth empowerment and young people being involved in decision making and policy making has become such an important topic. Of course, there's areas to grow, um, as there always is, but it's really nice to hear that. Um, so kind of asking another question um, to yourself, what do you sort of do now and how did those maybe, maybe even just like the lack of opportunities, how did that kind of put you in the role you are now um, and how did that kind of um, 
you can maybe reflect on how not having those opportunities has led you to maybe have a passion to create them and maybe drive for change. Yeah, how is that kind of applicable to what you're doing now? Okay, so uh, as Jessica mentioned at the beginning, I'm working in the European Commission now in a unit dealing with social sustainability, but in, I would never think I would be now here doing, doing this because finally I think life is a kind of patchwork of experiences and some experiences are good, some experiences are bad. You don't know what's going, what's going to happen. And then uh, also what it's important is how, what you do with these experiences and, and how you deal, you deal with them. So for example, in, I, I studied forest engineer and I wanted to specialize on tropical forestry because I wanted to go to South America to, to work on these uh, projects. But then I met my husband who is not a Spanish. And then, so my life finally changed co completely. But, but then finally you have a kind of compass of, of I think core values, like for example, in, in my case, I, I, I really want to try to contribute to a better world. I, have, I, I try to, to do important things for, for social. I, I, I do my best. So finally you have this kind of compass and, and life guides you like this. And then um, I think you, you can go into this direction, sometimes a, a little bit. In, in a different place where you were thinking or, or imagining. But I think uh, when I was 18 or when I was 20, I would never imagine where I would be now. And I'm working in the European Union. I, I brought the, the flag here. And I, I think it's um, the European Union, of course, we have some things that could be improved. But, but I think, it's, um, I think the, the world is a, it's a better place with the, with the European Union. So I'm, I'm very happy to contribute from my little corner and my little office to this. To this to this project and 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 well I know Europark you are you are also undertaking a project and that goes into into this good uh, direction so yes but but life I, you are very young all of you it, you never know where where it will bring you so I think it's important also to be flexible and then to to take all the experience in your back and and to try to to make the best possible use I don't know if I have done that but I I have tried at least. That's really interesting to to hear that, and I think I'm probably on the same sort of um, path as, as you are there. If I look back seven or eight years ago, I would have never thought I would have been doing the, the sort of have the opportunities and the and the yeah the work that I've that I've been been involved with over over the last last couple of years. Um, cer certainly um, wouldn't have thought that I would be. Um, yeah, being being on a webinar like this and meeting so many different people from uh, from across um, not just the continent but uh, across the world in a, in a lot in a lot of cases. Um, so yeah, so I'd like if if you were a young person now, what opportunities would you want to take part in? Good, good question. My, my problem is that I, I like to be involved on everything and then it's not, it's not possible, but I think there are so many, so many nice things that um, and there are so, so many opportunities. And if I compare when I was young, everything has changed so much co completely. I was referring before to internet, so it would be impossible to have this discussion like we are doing it now from, the, and I don't know from how many countries the participants are coming from but uh, as i told you wh when i was in the university no internet and no no gsm so this is different i think from the transport point of view so things have changed a lot so for example i think now you have more planes which are which is not a very sustainable option but you have also at the same time more bikes more bike infrastructure etc so i think the to 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 use a um, sustainable transport mode it's possible for for the young people more and more possible i think that's nice uh, from the waste point of view also things have improved really a lot so now you have all this recycling this composting and and all these initiatives i have now in my in my garden a possibility to make this this compost and and this also has changed completely compared to the to the to the past and and I think also the the opportunities to to be engaged in organizations like the rural youth or well rural youth you said that it was from the 50s but I guess without internet in the 90s not many people was aware <laughs> of that so so now I think if somebody wants to do something can google can can find 
the organization. I, I think it's always very helpful to find people with similar interests and, 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 and goals. And, and I think it, it makes probably easier, easier. And, and yes, so I, I think uh, probably, yes, thanks to all these tools, it's probably easier to, to get accompanied so that the, that the projects that you undertake, you have more, more people that can help you or that you can help them. Yeah, so probably this is um, a good, good issue fr from, the, from the situation now. Thank you so much, Maria. It was really, really lovely to, to hear uh, from you and um, also to hear from our young speakers and their experiences and how that um, may be similar or may be different um, between the years. So thank you very much for sharing with us. We are at the end of our second session and now I'd like to go back to the Padlet. I hope you all still have the tab open. If not, the link will come in the chat again. And yeah, so we would like to hear from you um, what you found interesting in that experience sharing session. Uh, what similarities or difference did you notice that were spoken about um, that you would like to share or comment on? So please feel free to uh, comment on that post um, and, and share there. I also in the I know that it will take you all a little bit of time to to think and collect your thoughts on that session. So I would also like to say that we could have a nice five minute break here as well. Take some time to to send us your thoughts on the Padlet. Take the time to take a loo break or fetch some water. Um, I also want to do a shout out for stretching because I don't know how many of you are doing this straight after work like me and haven't actually stood up since the end of work. And um, so I do suggest that everybody just get up and get your blood flowing, move your body a little bit, stretch out those legs. Um, yeah, and yeah, and take a moment. We will continue with the last session at uh, my six o'clock. So that's UTC plus two. If you're in the British and Portuguese time, that'll be your five o'clock. If you're in the Eastern European time, that'll be your seven o'clock. And if you're even further, then I hope you can figure out your time zone from that. So do take a moment uh, for yourself and send us your thoughts as well. We'd love to read them. Thank you. Yeah, it's really nice to, to see your messages in there. Um, do take some time to share your thoughts with us. Um, as we go on, you can also do so afterwards or you know, if you're watching the recording, and then perhaps you might also like to send us a message um, and let us know. So now we're going to be moving on to our last session of today. I hope you have all found this webinar quite interesting so far. Um, our last session is sharing opportunities. And now you've heard about how these young people got involved. Um, you heard about how things have, have improved and have been different over the years. And so we hope that this has inspired you to all get involved or to share opportunities with your friends, with your families, um, with people who you think um, would be interested. And the question is, what opportunities? So <laughs> with that, I would like to uh, pass the mic to each one of our youth speakers um, to share with you what they think is important opportunities um, that they think that everybody should know about. So. First up is Emma. Emma, would you like to share how you can get involved in YE or in a youth parliament or any other sort of um, activities that you are really passionate about? Yeah, definitely. So um, there's quite a few things that I could touch on in this. So I'll try and keep them as brief as possible. Um, and instead of being exactly the details of how to do them, I'll direct you to where to get those details because I will go over quite a lot. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll talk a wee bit specifically about um, YE first, um, so Youth and Environment Europe, um, and then briefly on um, kind of things specific to the Youth Parliament that I'm involved with, but my knowledge of what they're like across Europe, because I have a general knowledge of that. Um, and then I'll talk just kind of vaguely more on like the kind of how to actually do that, because it's very easy to say these are the opportunities, but actually actioning that is very difficult and I can totally appreciate that some people maybe have barriers to accessing them so I'll touch on that too um but as I said I'll try and be as brief as possible um so with EU Teens for Green at um, YE specifically 
um, our kind of call for projects has closed. Um, however, you can, of course, stay updated with all those projects and what's going on, and they spread all across Europe. Um, so there's probably one in the country that you're from. Um, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Um, we've, of course, got our podcast, and I would really encourage you to listen to that. Um, there's kind of, it's split into like two sections. There's a bit on kind of general background to Just Transition and more information about the project, because of course, I wouldn't expect everybody to know like the ins and outs of everything and know absolutely everything to do with it. Um, and that's why we like, created it, keeping young people in mind. Um, so you can actually go and learn as well as find out about the projects. Um, the project sesh, like kind of sections are around 10 to 15 minutes. So they're kind of bite sized, easy to listen to. Um, but they're honestly excellent. I enjoy having a role where I can um, speak to people all day about what they're doing. Um, and the kind of organisation itself, um, we've been hosting volunteers since 2001 under the European Voluntary Service Scheme, um, which of course, as well, you can find out more about. There's more about volunteering um, with us on the website and it's actually really in depth and detailed. Um, we also have two opportunities right now that might be of interest to people on the call. Um, one of them is we've got like a kind of open call for a member organisation. So um, because of the type of organisation we are, we have loads of different member organisations across Europe um, to kind of create that um, working together um, and kind of create that cohesive um, kind of approach to climate. Um, the call for this is the deadline is the 8th of June, so it is in two days. Um, and you can find out exactly when by time zone by looking at our social media. Um, so maybe you are involved in an organisation and you think you'd be the right kind of fit to work alongside us and work um, kind of in a general kind of organisation that supports other organisations. It's a really unique kind of position. Um, the other opportunity that I was going to mention is we're currently looking for board members um, and that's so that's more on kind of like the governance side of the organization um, and of course young people um, it's a really cool role to have I am not part of the board at YE but I'm part of the board of the Scottish Youth Parliament and um, so I kind of run that charity here um, and our chair um, Molly um, she's from the Highlands here so she's from um, in a little kind of place just above Inverness um, in the Scottish Highlands um, so it's really cool to have a rural chair, and that's obviously relevant to this. Um, and of course, um, a female chair. So um, very big feminist here. Um, and it's awesome to see young women, um, our vice chair as well as also a woman. So it's great to see um, particularly young women leading um, in a place that's specifically dominated typically by older men. Um, so that's really positive as well. Um, but yeah, the board member opportunity, the deadline for that is the 22nd of June, so a wee bit longer. Um, and again, you can find out more information about that, the kind of requirements. Um, it is a kind of um, governance level role, so um, it's not for everybody, but it is, again, a, a role that people can lead from and you can create quite a, a cool change. However, if that is not something that sounds like it's cool for you um particularly in scotland so we have a scottish youth parliament we have elections coming up i don't know if anybody on this call is from scotland but if you do um you can actually stand to be an msyp in november and registers of interest are open right now um if you're from any other of the kind of uk related countries um there is a youth parliament in every country in the uk and we have the uk youth parliament so there's opportunities there um, I know there's kind of like youth councils and youth parliament kind of organisations dotted all across Europe. So I would really encourage you to like, kind of just search it up on the internet. Um, you'll find it. Um, and those are honestly amazing. I, I've loved being involved in that kind of um, sphere. And I definitely encourage you to do that. And then from the kind of, without pushing for time, because I know um, there's other people that are going to talk on this, um, kind of how do I access those opportunities? I know it sounds like we get told it all the time, but you need to take the leap of faith. You need to take that step. Um, I actually have a disability. So that's the kind of thing that has stopped me in the past from getting involved in opportunities. I have dyslexia. So um, I find it really, really difficult to read and write. Um, but there's support. Like if you just kind of like say to people, look, I, I struggle with this. Can you give me a wee bit of support on that? Um, generally, everybody's willing to help. Um, 
I, it's a shame sometimes that we hear on the news like kind of the negatives but um I guess my other piece of advice is look for the positives um so many people even in like tiny little local communities are running projects and um, we are so lucky as media highlighted earlier to have the opportunity of the internet um and we have these literally at our fingertips um but yeah if you're not an internet kind of person visit your local library find out where all these kind of like advice centers are community centers um yeah, just to encourage you to kind of take that leap of faith. Maybe you'll start your own organisation or your own campaign. Completely up to you. But hopefully um, I've inspired somebody, um, even that person sitting with a bit of passion somewhere that's like just needed that like extra kick. You can totally do it. You have like literally all the skills. You have all the powers and you'll make new friends. You'll learn so much. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop talking now. But thank you so much again for um, having this opportunity um, to speak to people. Thank you so much, Emma. Your enthusiasm is really contagious. Um, and I can only wholeheartedly echo your advice. Just take the leap. Um, it is really amazing what you can do when you connect with other people who, um, like, you'd be surprised how many people there are out there that want the same things that you do. And even some things that you've just complained about all the time, you know, you just need to find other people who feel the same way and then you can change it. Or, or find a way to make it better. Um, so I really do do encourage everybody to find a place either locally where they can get involved or also at, at, a, at a larger scale. Emma, one question for you um, that might be of interest to the audience is being part of one of these youth councils or youth parliaments. And if it's such a big national network, how do you organize? Is it mostly online? So in Scotland specifically, um, I actually just came from one of the coolest meetings that we do that is, um, I believe we are the only country in the world that does this. Um, I just came from a thing that we call cabinet takeover. Um, so we met with the cabinet secretaries and the first minister of Scotland, so our kind of government, um, and spoke to them about issues affecting young people. So we had seven um, members of Scottish Youth Parliament, including our chair and our vice chair. Um, and we also had members of the Children's Parliament. Um, so in Scotland specifically, the Children's Parliament, um, I've forgotten what their age group is, but they're kind of like the, the age below us. We represent 11, 12 to 25, so 11 to 26. Um, that's kind of our age range and that's what we regard as young people um, but we do in-person stuff too so we're kind of doing like a blended approach um, during Covid it was all online um, but today we were in St Andrew's House which is like a kind of like a government related building in Scotland um, and at that um, one of the actually the people that I was with was talking about the um, circular economy um, and particularly we've got a bill going through Scotland right now um, on the, the circular economy um, so kind of talking about that and last year um, one of my friends Molly um, who's also the chair was talking about climate too so climate is like something that's really important here and we had the opportunity to meet with like our government um, which is really cool but yeah we have like a sort of blended approach the UK Youth Parliament um because I'm also lucky to sit on that too <laughs> um, I'm a steering group member for Scotland so I kind of represent Scottish um, kind of support our team basically um, again it's kind of a blended approach so we do online meetings but we also do in-person meetings and we've got our annual conference coming up this year in July um, but yeah that's pretty cool um, I hope that also answered your question thank you so much yes it does um, my colleague has put some links in the chat to YE and to Spotify with the podcast, but Emma, feel free to share any other links that you think are really important for people to know in the chat. Thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, this event, we were focusing mainly on the fields of biodiversity, climate and agriculture, but from Maria's experience getting involved in social issues or Emma's getting involved in governance, all of these are so interlinked um, that it is really, it's hard to stick to these categories. We don't actually want to. There are loads of opportunities for young people and the topic of um, biodiversity loss and climate change um, and sustainability needs to, to be in all aspects of our life because it impacts all aspects of our life. So thank you so much um, to all of you for also sharing that interconnectedness and making these links and, and showing how important these topics are in all spheres. 
And so, Kailane, would you like to share with us a little bit um, about, yeah, the Europark and the junior rangers and how young people in Europark can are getting involved and how other people might be able to find these opportunities? Go ahead. So Emma talks about uh, a youth council as well. Um, we also have a youth council, but I'll get to that. Um, so um, what do I want to say? Oh yeah. Uh, so junior junior range program was for me um, a very good experience. I've created friends for life, and I've been. I was enthusiastic about nature and um, everything. Well, it. I think to get young people to be amazed and be like, whoa, how beautiful is this? I think that is what I do in my classroom. I try to, uh, even within the whole uh, education system. But within the junior ranger program, we get the chance to get young people to be amazed about nature and them wanting to protect that. Um, wonderful experience and nature. Um, so for me, that was also the case. And um, I think it was a really exp great experience for me to grow up and be more involved with nature. And especially with Youth Plus, I got also a few internships with uh, some um, organizations. And I think that was such a nice experience for me to um, well, kickstart some of my network um, because most of the things that are very hard for young people is not knowing where to go, um, who to ask. So with the Junior Ranger program and the Juve Plus program, that gets a bit more easier, I think, um, because you get to collaborate with more experienced, <laughs> people and uh, they know the way already so they can help you sort of like get your foot in between the door somewhere and well talk you up or whatever and get you involved with projects um so one of the projects i will talk about in a bit but um for example we, we if you want to be involved with the junior ranger program which is most of the time in most um, of the countries uh, age 13 until 18, um, you can get to your national park. And most of the time it's on the website of the national park, but also on your park website, which is also in the chat. <laughs> uh, you can also uh, look it up there. It's a junior ranger program and you can get your niece or your nephew to sign up. Maybe if you're under 18 and you're here, you can also sign up. Um, but it's very different uh, how it's organized within every national park. So I can't say how it's organized there. So you just have to look up and contact your local um, organization. Um, with Youth Plus, it's a bit more complicated because we have like the locals and then the nationals and then the internationals. Um, also with the locals and the nationals, it's very different um, in each country. So you also have to look up the same with the national, with junior agent program, you have to look up the locals. Um, you can, most of the time they have like an Instagram. Uh, so look that up, just youth plus, um, or uh, get in touch with your national park. Um, so you can look that up. Also on the your park website, you can um, look up the youth plus program. We also have a Youth Plus Council. Well, it's sort of in progress to get there. We also have a Youth Plus uh, representative on the board of the Europark. Um, so that's very cool. And he gets to decide and um, well contribute to uh, decision-making on the Europark. Um, for me, uh, because I was on a Youth Plus program, I got to sit on very, boring board meetings with um well local governments i didn't get really a say in it but it was really cool to um experience how these things go because it was with all the 
gray-headed people and I was like well you can also do it like that and they were like oh yeah 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 so that was a really fun experience uh so that's also very cool um if you are in a Jupiter program you can also get invited with these things and you're, you don't know what you're doing and you have the imposter syndrome like Emma said but well um and a very cool thing that I really needed to talk about is the Europark conference that is coming up, which is also, um, well, because I am in the Youth Plus program, I was invited to take part in the Youth Core team. And we're, the Europark conference is for members, but we also want a lot of youth there. So everyone who is here, I hope to see you in October in the Netherlands on a conference. Um, you can sign up. Uh, it's also in a link at the chat. Um, and it's a bit like this, sharing experiences, doing workshops, um, expand your network. Uh, we have also some great field trips in the Netherlands, so you get to see around. And we also have very cool workshops. Um, some are only for youth and some are um, also with other people. Um, we have a few spots left for a free, um, well, you can uh, join the conference for free and your accommodation will be um, paid for as well. So you can sign up for that as well. We have only a few spots left, so be quick and get your place maybe. And if you don't get that, we also have um, a youngster's fee. So you can like get, uh, I think 70% off. So that will be good. And we also are creating a padlet for uh, young people where you can stay for cheap, um, get the experience of Leeuwarden, which is the town where it will be. So in October from two to, uh, two to six October, I think I'm correct um that will take place so i hope to see you all thank you so much kylene uh, for sharing with us something that might also be interesting to our listeners so europark unlike ye and unlike rural youth europe is not a youth-led organization you know we are a member network of protected area authorities um, and at Despite that, youth is very much also one of our uh, main focuses, and we really do encourage as many of our members as possible to do a junior ranger program. However, some of our members are government based, and sometimes they need a bit of a push. So if you really, really want to do a junior ranger program in the closest park, it doesn't have to be a national park. It can be a peri urban park, a nature park, a Nurture 2000 site, um, anything. Um, that is contributing towards uh, nature conservation. And if they uh, yeah, push them to start a junior ranger program uh, for Europark members, uh, that is a free program that they can, um, they can implement. And we have lots of tools for them to be able to do it. And we have lots of mentors who love sharing their experience from other parks and can help um, a park get set up. Um, and yeah, to become a Europark member, there is also just a small yearly fee uh, so, and you get all these opportunities like coming to the Europark conference where we'll be talking about biodiversity, we'll be talking about people, we'll be talking about stakeholder engagement, we'll be doing workshops, field trips, it'll be amazing. So if this is something that you like, if you know any young farmers, rural youth Europe, uh, that would be interested in biodiversity conservation and, and combining those, do, do tell them about the discount, our early bird uh, fee is still available until the 15th of June um, and after that there's still a 50% discount for youth which will be until the registration closes so um, do take do take um, that opportunity if this is something that interests you. I also would like to to just let you know that Europark has a youth manifesto the young people on our network did come together five years ago and they decide, decided to make a youth manifesto for uh, rural areas specifically. And that's something that different Youth Plus groups have been campaigning for at a local level. So this is what resulted in Carlene being part of that board. It's resulted in the Cairngorms Youth Action Team that have a fund that they as young people manage and distribute to youth projects around the Cairngorms um, and many other projects um, across Europe. So if you're interested, 
in taking the youth manifesto, you can always just send me an email uh, or contact your park in general um, and ask for me. And yeah, we can chat more about that. So last but not least, I'd also like to give the floor to Rural Youth Europe um, for Niall to share with you opportunities through his organization. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's gonna be difficult to, uh, to follow those, those two speeches, but we'll, we'll give, we'll give it a go now. Um, I wish I went first. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, we touched a bit about, about, but I touched a bit upon about what we do when I first spoke earlier on. Um, so we have member organisations from um, Ireland in the West through to Georgia in the East. Um, I think most most countries in Europe, well, certainly Northern Europe, we have we have organisations that feed into into us. Um, so yeah, we hold the three three main events during the year and we're starting to certainly during like the pandemic and things like that we've started to put on um like webinars and um start getting involved in more 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 and more projects because of expanding our reach expanding what we do expanding what what we can bring into the organization um thomas has spoken about the coco riado project earlier on and uh, we also got involved in a couple of um, communication projects across the across the year one of our project was uh, the 25 percent project which um brings the voice of rural young people uh, out to um to to a wider audience um so with with that we had to between a consortium of uh, 10 or 12 members i can't remember it was to bring together 10,000 ideas of how to um make rural living better and um try and encourage more people to to live in more rural areas so that's really what we what we, what we do we try to get ourselves involved in places that can that can involve more younger people excuse me um so yeah our we've so we're 65 years old last year this year we are 66 um, we're in in the run up to our rally now. Um, we're always looking for member organisations to to join us. You don't specifically have to be of a rural rural organisation. We'll take we'll, we'll take, but we'll have mo most of most organisations who will probably cater for 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 the majority. Um, so we can we our organisations. We've got obviously four. A lot of 4-H organisations, uh, Land Jürgen, Young Farmers. Um, so we, our age range is anywhere between the ages of six up to 35. Um, and once once you start taking all organisations into into our into our catchment, I'm from the Young Farmers here in Wales, and to also join with join with England. I've sat on the on the councils there of both organizations for the past oh dear me uh five years at least in wales and probably three to four in in as a national organization um so i've sort of got myself involved through one one way or another and my my biggest thing is uh, international travel and in, international um networking that's my uh that's my area that i like to work on um so yeah i just try to try to encourage everyone to sort of go out their comfort zone a little bit and um yeah and see see what's see what's out there because the world's a very small place certainly when everyone starts talking i can guarantee people or no other people not on this call um and someone's gonna be friends with someone so uh it's, it's surprising and that's what we do as an organization is bring people together um and it comes very becomes very obvious um who does know each other through different events um i went to my first event six years ago and i've never looked back um and i've made friends friends for life through through that and it's one of the big things that i i sort of pride the organization on is making friendships building bridges um ac across uh, across the continent um so 
yeah, we're always looking for new opportunities. So if anyone does have any opportunities that they would like us to be involved with or would, could point in the right direction, we'd be we'd be glad to take it on. And like I said, we're always looking for for new member member organisations. Um, so if anyone does have any interest, fire me a. I'll put my email into into the chat and be be my guest. Fire fire me across an email. Um, and also if anyone would like to learn about any of our events, we do have a podcast series. Um, called Rural Voices, um, and it's on our website, and it's also on Spotify. Um, we have podcasts from most most events. Um, Dan, who's in charge of our uh, communications, uh, does our does our podcasts, and uh, he's pretty good at them. Um, it's something we like to pride ourselves pride ourselves on is is that side of it. So it's definitely worth definitely worth a listen, and it, it's we're definitely it would probably tell you more about the uh, about the events and what we do than I could I could ever tell you. So uh, I definitely encourage encourage that. Um, and like I, like I say, if anyone wants to know any, any more, fire me across an email or a message or anything like that, and I'll be more than happy to um, to have further conversations. But um, that's probably enough from me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, yeah, I think what you said, Niall, applies to all the rest of us as well. If you have any questions, feel free to send any of our organizations an email. Young people really like meeting with other young, enthusiastic people. So we will be really happy to get emails from you um, or social media messages or new followers on social media um, who would like to interact with us and hear about what the opportunities are. So I'd like to say a big thank you um, to all of our speakers um, for coming and spending this time after your working hours uh, with us today and sharing your experiences with our audience. To our audience, thank you so much for staying with us. I know it's been quite a long afternoon. Um, in the Padlet, you can see there's a last question about opportunities. So I know we only had a short time to share from our three organizations, but there are plenty of opportunities out there for young people. And there are opportunities for funding, um, especially with the EU, with Erasmus projects, with the European Solidarity Corps, um, with working with local partners. And um, so if you have any specific questions, um, do reach out to us. I think each of our organizations knows um, some things and will be willing to direct you into, into um, directions that can be helpful for your country, for your situation, for that which you want to work on, whether it be biodiversity, climate, or agriculture, um, and really making, um, yeah, making a just transition in rural areas across Europe, because that's what we want to do, but it takes individual motivation to make that first leap. It takes um, a lot of um, enthusiasm and it needs to be happening everywhere all at once. <coughs> Sorry. So with that, I'd like to say thank you so much. Um, if anybody still has some questions, I'll be in the room and can answer the chat. Otherwise, I want to wish you all a very lovely Tuesday. And for those of you in Brussels or still attending other EU Green Week events, uh, I wish that you can have a lot of cool opportunities and that they are all as enthusiastic, as hopeful and as inspiring as this session was for me and I hope for you too. So with that, I'll stop recording and I'll let you all leave. And thank you so much uh, for being here and for being with us today. <laughs>